Carnegie scientists explore the outermost reaches of space, the mysterious depths of the Earth, and the origins and mechanisms of life. Our scientists are chosen for unique skills and boldness. Their amazing discoveries, spanning more than a century, demonstrate the power of freedom. Carnegie investigators are intrepid adventurers who pursue their goals even as they mentor and train the next generation of scientists. They are free, free to question, to wonder, to creatively pursue ideas from the vast universe to the subatomic world. We explore the past to understand the present and inform the future. Welcome, everyone. It's just wonderful to see so many familiar faces as well as new faces in this beautiful auditorium. When the first Archaeopteryx fossil was discovered in 1860, Thomas Huxley, a friend, of, a friend and champion of Charles, Charles Darwin, immediately noted its similarity to, to modern birds. Other people did, too. There was speculation that the similarities involved evolution through natural selection. But the evidence was scanty, and the idea languished for over a century. It was only in the 1970s that confirmation began appearing, electrifying the field of paleontology and bringing the startling realization that dinosaurs are among us. Our guest tonight, Dr. Julia Clark, is a foremost authority on the evolutionary relationships between dinosaurs and birds. She is especially interested in how structures in birds and current day animals developed and how mechanisms of movement, such as flying, evolved. Her remarkable reconstruction of dinosaurs have shed light on how dinosaur appearance and vocalization occurred. Dr. Clark is a professor and the John A. Wilson Centennial Fellow in Vertebrate Paleontology in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. She's also a member of the graduate faculty of the University's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, a Howard Hughes Medical Institute professor and a research associate at both the Field Museum in Chicago and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. She received her bachelor's degree from Brown University and her PhD from Yale. Whether in her own lab or at a dig site, Dr. Clark brings her insatiable curiosity to big problems in evolutionary biology. Her field sites in Antarctica, Peru, New Jersey, New, New, <laughs> New Zealand, and <laughs> Mongolia have yielded a variety of fossils, including the first Cretaceous fossil of duck-like bird. The study of this fossil has changed how we think about avian evolution. She serves as co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Anatomy, as well as an associate editor of Paleobiology. She's earned many awards for her research and teaching including in 2016, a prestigious Hombard Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Julia Clark. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm pretty sure this is in New Jersey, right? Or, or New Zealand, I think. Um, thank you so much to the Carnegie for inviting me and uh, for all of you guys for coming out today. So I think uh, hopefully we'll have some, some fun with Secret Lives of Dinosaurs today. Um, I want to start by, in fact, the secret behind the Secret Lives of Dinosaurs, which is really what our science looks like. And when we talk about paleontology, we can easily imagine these kinds of scenes, you know, Antarctica and Peru, um, in Chile, where I've worked, 
And, uh, but at the same time, my most exciting discoveries, perhaps they started in the field, but perhaps they didn't. But these most exciting and transformative discoveries to me ended up in a very different place. I ended up with rich data sets on living animals, looking at the geometry of wing shape or the brain structure in living bird species that are closely related or color, or looking at how we explain the blue color in penguin feathers. And it was integrating these two different kinds of data, data we only get from going in the field and making new discoveries, and stuff we do in the lab that's really, to me, transformed kind of how I think about dinosaurs and helped um, been the most exciting part of what I do. The other part of what I do that I think is, is essential is that the work is of many minds, minds of, of scientists, experts who are from lots of different disciplines and from students from very different um, backgrounds. So it's in fact the diversity of all of these perspectives that I think makes um, for the most fun and uh, creative science. So with that, let's launch in to thinking about what do I mean by the secret lives of dinosaurs? Well, um, as we, I don't need to remind you, dinosaurs have had a rich life in our imagination since their first discovery. So if we go back to that moment, we've been imagining both dinosaurs, how they looked, um, how we might have interacted with them. <laughs> um, so we've had a rich emotional life, an imaginary life around dinosaurs for hundreds of years. Even as our reconstructions of dinosaurs became more informed by actual data, we were fascinated not so much with the presence of dinosaurs in, in ancient, uh, in deep time, but what might they have done? So in fact, what did they sound like? What did they look like? What were the behaviors of these animals? So we wanted to go beyond what did they eat to a richer picture of what um, dinosaurs were like. And so I, a couple of years ago, posed this question that I think we're all sort of asking on some level, asking even today, which is, what can science tell us about what we really want to know, these secret lives of dinosaurs? So to talk about this today, I'm going to have to tell you how we figure things out. So let's start there. Most of the fossil record of dinosaurs is bony fossils. So that is bony remains of different dinosaurs. So what we do as scientists, and how I like to explain it in my classes, is we look, we use a rich language of shape and form. We look at the tiny structures on each of these bones, and we compare them among different organisms. And we use these, we read these fossils as sort of texts that tell us how they fit together into one evolutionary history uh, overall. So essentially, we've assembled data sets that are hundreds of characters rich, that are these bony features that have told us wh what dinosaurs are related to. Now my work, because I'm interested in going a little bit further with this, has involves another very important data source, one shown here by another Julia. So, in fact, the truth is, I like to play with my food. And dissection is a way, when we look at living animals, we bring in that evolutionary context and we relate bones and flesh to bony structures that preserve very easily in the fossil record. We have to bring together, if we want to know these secret lives, we have to bring together data from living animals and data from these bony structures that are easily preserved. So that's kind of the big picture of where we, how we work as paleontologists in general. But let's get in to our more specific questions. So in terms of what we know about uh, dino what dinosaurs looked like, the first thing I want to say is that Jurassic Park lied to you. But how do, we, how do we figure that out, right? How do we, in fact, look at all these bony evidence that we have and um, figure out what these extinct forms um, might have been like? So, in fact, 
back to those very earliest discoveries, we were thinking about relationships. We were thinking about what are these fossil bones that we call dinosaur remains, what are they related to? And so this, in this very early reconstruction, you can see what we thought they looked like, which I think looks a lot like this dude. This is a cute little guy, but in fact has very little to do with trying to figure out what dinosaurs looked like. This is a tuatara from New Zealand, and in fact, you can see it's most closely related to living snakes and lizards. And when I say these things, these are based upon years and hundreds of these little characters or features I talked about that help us figure out evolutionary relationships, but also, in this day and age, molecular sequence data that support these relationships. So if we wanted to figure out what the ancestor of lizard snakes and to Atara's look like, that little dude might be relevant. But in fact, we know from all of these forms of evidence that I told you about that extinct dinosaurs are in a very different part of the tree of life. And they're most closely related to living dinosaurs or birds, and their closest cousins are these guys, these crocodiles. So, but if we look at what these two close relatives of living birds look like, they look very different. One kind of maybe fits our more traditional understanding or intuition about what dinosaurs looked like, largely supported and enabled by the media. And the other looks like a happy-go-lucky, very, very different from what we imagine extinct dinosaurs being like. Well, since about 1996, we've actually had data to bring to bear on this question. And these data come from a series of lakes, lake deposits in North northern China, mostly northeastern China, that are of all different ages. And in these lakes, what you have is a series of very fine rocks that when you break them apart inside, you preserve um, fine structures of extinct animals. So these are structures that are rarely preserved in the fossil record, including skin and feathers and other structures. So the first of these dinosaurs to really start changing our understanding was Cynosteropteryx in 1996. And what was so striking about this tiny turkey-sized dinosaur was that it had these um, filament-like structures that went and were kind of banded in the tail region. And this was not what we were expecting. So we were expecting to find something scaly, or maybe at least skin-covered. Like this filament or fuzz that we now have from hundreds of dinosaur specimens, potentially even into the thousands, was not what we were expecting. But here we have actual data that the new Jurassic Park movie chose to ignore um, on what dinosaur body coverings might have looked like. So, and I could go on and on. Here's a pony-sized, I like to say pony-sized Tyrannosaurid because it's just fun, um, that has these filaments on the tail. And now we have full-sized Tyrannosaurids that also show these filaments or fuzz-like structures. So this is one part of our new understanding of dinosaur body coverings that really should change the way we think about them. More closely related to birds based on those bony features that I talked about, we have small raptor dinosaurs that have branched feathers. So they have a central part like the pen of the feather, and then you have branched barbs and barbules coming off of those feathers. And a whole hundreds of these specimens that show um, these, these feather structures like living birds. So if we put these together, we can see that across dinosauria, what we have is a lot of dinosaurs with some kind of filament or fuzz on part of the body, and a smaller group of dinosaurs closely related to birds that have branched or pinnate feathers. And I like to point out in this that what is our evidence for scales? Because then you could always make the argument that scales are there too. Well, they are. This is an embryonic um, sauropod dinosaur with scales, and we know that they have these structures. We also know that there are scales in ceratopsian dinosaurs, and there are scales in other big herbivores. Now, we know that in some of these species, they had both scales, skin, and filaments. 
So just as we, our body covering is not the same over our entire <laughs> skeleton or our entire body, um, you can have dinosaurs that have different filaments or, or skin on different parts of the body uh, in, these, in these extinct forms. So here's a reconstruction. This was a, a more kind of colorful reconstruction of this animal. We now have further data on what this guy might have looked like, but you can see the combination of body coverings imagined here. Mostly, however, we've had um, evidence of, sc of scales in these ceratopsian dinosaurs. So clearly not all dinosaurs are the same, but we know many of them have these filaments or bristles. In fact, potentially the capacity to make, based on molecular sequence data, the capacity to produce filaments and bristles is ancestral to the total group Dinosauria. So that means that you might just, you can add, you, there might just be small portions of the body that have these different structures, or it could be a full body covering like we see in some smaller dinosaurs that are more closely related to birds. So overall, what's the picture? This is just a little summary. We have, um, the fossil record of scales is not hugely rich within dinosauria. A lot of it's from the later part of the dinosaurian fossil record. Um, but what we do know now is that Pterosaurs, which are not dinosaurs, also have small filaments on um, the body as well. So potentially, even outside earlier than dinosauria, little filaments are present. Again, that's supported by some uh, new molecular studies that we've done. So I think this is cool. Jurassic Park did not think this was cool, so they decided to remove the filaments and feathers from the dinosaurs. But in fact, I think it's fabulous. So if we, ha you know, a science-informed picture of what dinosaur body coverings look like is cool. These reconstructions, some of them, are beautiful. Yes, it changes our understanding, our intuition of what these animals are like because it removes them from the realm of the lizard. Nothing wrong with that. Time to do it. So, um, in fact, if we know more about what the body, the type of body coverings that are present in dinosaurs were like, we can get to another question. This is the perennial question, I think, among young people. And young people, that actually spans all ages. You can be young uh, your whole life. But we all love dinosaurs and dinosaur toys, and you've got these. You can imagine, in your imagination, dinosaurs can be whatever color you want right? You can be purple or blue or whatever these things are. But if we try to approach this question with science, we're going to go back to our evolutionary pr principles. That's where, just as um, the director alluded to in the opening, the principles, the first discoveries of fossil birds were important to, to, the, to the realization of a theory of evolution. Um, you, we look to living animals. So we're going to look to things that have even cl closer or more disparate r relationships with the extinct dinosaur. So across vertebrates, the most common pigmentation type is melanin-based pigmentation. It is, in fact, what you have. So you deploy melanin in not just your skin, but your hair color. So uh, all of these different forms, most of them not particularly closely related to dinosaurs, but also some that are, across all of these taxa, the most common pigmentation type is melanin. So specifically what we know for mammals and birds is that the melanin that is in their feathers or their hair is packed into these tiny organelles called melanosomes. So the melanin's not just loose in the feather or the hair, but it's packed into these little packages. And in fact, what we've discovered, and this was actually first discovered with respect to mammals, um, that the pigment packages that are, contain pheomelanin, which mostly produces red colors. So if I have any redheads in the audience, you have more pheomelanin. And in these elongate packages, those correlate with m more eumelanin. Not entirely eumelanin, they have a pheomelanin core, but more uh, of the eumelanin is present. 
Well, it was the discovery of a grad student actually in 2008 um, at Yale University and colleagues that he was working with there. He made the discovery that these melanin filled structures could actually fossilize. And that discovery was first reported with respect to this feather from the Cretaceous, which has these distinct bands. I should point out that in the areas that are white in these feathers, there are no pigment packages present. It's the absence of these melanosomes. So if we go to this fossil feather, what did they notice? In the black part of the feather, there were these aligned bodies that were the same size and shape as living bird melanosomes. So here are melanosomes associated with gray and black color. Here are the fossil structures. And here's the rock matrix showing the absence of melanosomes in the white part of the feather here. Well, one thing to remember is that, so you might infer from this data, just data alone, that we have a dark color, like a black or a, brown or a gray, and a white band in this feather. Kind of intuitive in that sense. Why is there a relationship between melanosome shape and, the, and color? Well, there was a study that was done in mammals where they actually assayed the melanin chemistry within these melanosomes and could determine that the chemistry was related to the shape of these structures. So here's in black hair, we have more eumelanin and these more ovoid shaped melanosomes and round melanosomes that are more pheomelanin enriched. So what we did around 2009 was take this new realization that melanosomes could fossilize and go to look at feathered dinosaurs. So this was the first dinosaur that we worked on this is the skull, and around the skull there were these dark areas. So we took samples from feathers all around the skull of this animal, and as you can see, some areas had round structures preserved, and some had these elongate, skinny melanosomes preserved. We did that all over the body, more than 60 samples all over, and sometimes these impressions were just that, they were void spaces rather than three-dimensionally preserved um, structures. So what we did was measure uh, these, any complete ones that we could see preserved in the different samples, and we compared them to a very new library that my colleagues here, who are now at Ghent University, created a library of the relationship between melanosome structure and known color measured by in a spectrophotometer, so you have an actual quantifiable color associated with the geometries of these melanosomes. We used that to predict color in the fossil, and this is what we came up with. So this was the first data-based so the first scientific reconstruction of a dinosaur that's based on estimating the color of each feather region based on comparison with feathers of known color and the melanosome shapes of known color in living dinosaurs or birds. So this guy, what we see here, and how does it give us an insight into the, the secret lives of dinosaurs, you can see he's got a cowboy ruff, right? He's got a, a large... That's what I call it. I don't know, maybe I've been in Texas too long, but you've got this white region down the back of the legs. You have broad uh, white patches on the wing and this reddish or reddish brown tonality on the head. It's actually not that dissimilar than what we see, obviously, in living, many living bird species today. And in studies of living bird species, we know that large color patches are used in signaling. That is in communication with other parts of their species typically. So in these, we see rather than small color patches um, that are also seen in living birds, typically associated with crypsis or camouflage. So here we started looking at what color is my dinosaur, if you will, which sounds kind of like a very you know, fun question for kids. But we get into dinosaur biology by looking at what these kinds of signals or these color patches might mean. We then did, went on to another dinosaur. This is a Microraptor specimen. These are things that are very close to flight's origin, and we don't know precisely how they moved. But they do have 
branch long um, feathers that are anatomically very close to those of living birds. So in this dinosaur, what did we find? Well, we found a very different story. This is a 120 million year old dinosaur. And this was a really cool study because we actually ended up discovering something new about living birds. We had to expand our data set. So my colleagues at Ghent University um, went from just looking at blacks and browns and grays and whites to looking at iridescence. So in a lot of birds, including these charismatic guys over here, uh, they create this iridescent color through melanosome arrays. So the, the melanosomes are organized into levels and they refract light to create this iridescent sheen. But we didn't know what melanosome shapes were associated with these arrays. So we expanded the data set to look at, at the shape of melanosomes in iridescent arrays. And why did we do that? Because what we saw in the fossil was that all over the body of the fossil, there were hyper elongate melanosomes. And my colleagues had only seen those in ducks. But when we systematically studied that across birds, we found that was consistently true for this form of iridescence, which is just one form of avian iridescence, these very elongate melanosomes. So in fact, we reconstructed this uh, microraptor specimen with evidence of uh, iridescence. We don't know how bright that iridescence is because as you can see, the structure or organization of the arrays is not preserved. So the, the organization of the arrays, the spacing of the arrays can, can, is the difference between this red tonality and this black tonality. So in fact, that's what we don't know about this particular dinosaur, but we know that it had a form of iridescence. Most recently, this was one of my favorite projects ever. This just came out in uh, January, I believe, of this year. And this was another new dinosaur species shown over here on the left, small dinosaur. This dinosaur is older than Archaeopteryx. It's about 160 million years old. And what we see in it, what was really neat when we started looking at the feather structure in the sky, is that we saw these, which were kind of like, um, I don't know, Nilla wafers, except a little bit more ovoid, and they were stacked. And they were only on the front part of the body. So these organized Nilla wafer-shaped melanosomes were only on the front of the body, whereas the back of the body had normal eumelanosomes associated with black color. So this, we then analyzed over there, if you look at the pink region, it only broadly overlaps the melanosome shape seen in hummingbirds. Now, hummingbirds have a really cool um, melanosomes. They kind of look like Rice Krispie treats, at least to me. Other people describe them as hollow, but I think Rice Krispie treat-like is, is more appropriate. <laughs> but they have these ones that are shaped almost like those Nilla wafers, but they have little holes in them, and they have very bright iridescence. So what we know in this dinosaur is it has evidence of the kind of um, stacked platelet-shaped melanosomes, but they are not hollow. This kind of um, melanosome shape is also seen in swifts. So this is another way living birds make iridescent color. Now in dinosaurs, these are dinosaurs that are not yet fully volant in the same way that we living birds are, there are two forms of iridescence present. So what have we learned besides the, the, uh, the, the kind of gee whiz of uh, another form of iridescence in dinosaurs. To me, the coolest part of the story is that what we see in an evolutionary framework is as soon as we have branched feathers, they're patterned. These are before, an, before the origin of flight as we know it in a living bird. So we have strong evidence of big color patches, iridescence, stripes and spots that are all present before feathers were used in flight. So we've known that feathers might be important in signaling, but what we've shown now is that a lot of what we think about or we know about living birds, the importance of sexual selection, the importance of visual communication and signaling, these are 
present in dinosaurs before we have this form of flight that we see in living birds. So in terms of our insights into dinosaur behavior, in fact, their secret lives, we know that there was a lot of communication, at least in the small dinosaurs that are more closely related to birds, that there was an, a lot of uh, uh, visual um, communication going on. So that affects like the evolution of the brain and other things that we'll see later on right now. Um, so another aspect of behavior is not just visual communication, but it is vocal communication, what I'm doing right now, right? So I'm, so in fact, this is something that we know is part of complex communities or a com complexity in terms of behavior. But what might these dinosaurs have sounded like? So let's, let's first look at what dinosaurs sounded like in our imagination. There should be sound. And if there isn't, I would really love some sound because there's a lot of sound in this next portion of the talk. <laughs> Can we get some? We tried this before and there was sound. So uh, now I'm gonna have to act this dinosaur out. <laughs> um, not really proud of that, but you know we do what we have to do. Uh, so in fact, in our imagination, there's two things going on in this image, right? These kids are running away and this giant scary dinosaur is pursuing them. And what sound does he make? Do it with me. Roar, right? Okay, what does that sound like? A lion. That's not an accident because a lot of movies draw their animal sounds based on a bank of animal sounds where they remix the sound that they want <coughs> for a particular creature. Yeah, I'd love to fix the sound before the next video. So I don't have to act that one out too. But um, so when we see that, think about how biased. I've, I've taped dinosaur exhibits all over the world. You, every one of them uses a roar. Why do they use a roar? Because dinosaurs are big and scary, lions and tigers and bears, and we make them sound like an extant carnivore. And what do we have in terms of large extant carnivores? Mammals. How closely related is a mammal to our dinosaurs? Not very closely related. So in fact, we are bringing back how fundamental evolution is to the story in looking at how we should be thinking about dinosaur sound making. Um, so the question might be, okay, what other ways do we have to approach this question? Is there some other toolkit, some kind of direct evidence that might allow us to start approaching this question? And this is a video that I will try to narrate if there's no sound. This is so funny because it all worked, of course, when we were practicing. All right, this is a dramatic zoom in on this apparatus that's just been printed from, this is from the third Jurassic Park. I really wish you could hear this. And he's looking at it, and he holds it up, and it goes, well, it makes a sound. And he says, that's brilliant. We just should have had it sooner. It's a velociraptor resonating chamber, OK? So he blows through it, and it makes a sound, and he says it's a velociraptor resonating chamber. Well, again, I need to give Jurassic Park some tips on how actual sound is produced. Let's take a look at that since we don't have any sound. But I have sound in the next slide, so I'd love to have some sound. <laughs> okay, so let's look at what you really would want to print if you're going to make something to call the velociraptors to you or whatever is going on in that particular scene. I am communicating with you right now using my larynx. My larynx is generating uh, a humming noise that's being shaped by my upper vocal tract and it is turning into words that I'm using to communicate with you. Crocodilians have a form of that. So it, crocodilians, like all other land-dwelling vertebrates except birds, um, use a larynx. And in fact, crocodilians are pretty vocal. So what we know about them is we've actually, in a very recent paper, started to very minutely take apart their, um, 
take apart the very minute muscles that are around their vocal folds. So this is sort of like a croc steak. It's like a steak through the head of a crocodilian. What you see in the colors are muscles that are around the opening at the end of the airway. And it is those muscles that retract um, the vocal folds, which are thickening of the end of the airway, the larynx, um, in a crocodilian. So all other tetrapods use this as the primary source of sound, although it can be shaped by upper vocal tract filtering. Here what we see in birds is they have a unique vocal organ. The number of times in the history of life a unique novel vocal organ has arisen and the larynx has been lost once. Well, what features of birds we've, have we seen so far that are not just in living birds but evolved in dinosauria? We've seen feathers, we've seen the coloration mechanisms, the, the, the iridescence and other th forms of communication. We know sometime within dinosauria, we go from a larynx-based sound source to a syrinx-based sound source. And I like to say, a lot of folks don't realize this, even consummate birders, that the vocal organ in a living bird is located next to the heart, literally right next to the heart. So you can say birds sing from the heart. Next time you hear some birds singing. It's highly complex in things like songbirds. It's much more simple in earlier parts of that group. This is a syrinx right here of a, a bird that is a basal or an early branch in the tree. You can see s uh, several muscles on the outside and the, the um, sound producing areas in pink. We're using new technologies for visualizing these in, in minute detail. So what, why are we doing that? Well, we want to be able to understand how structures relate to the vocal production, the, the, the sound making, so that we can potentially find fossilizable structures that can tell us what extinct birds and hopefully other dinosaurs sounded like as well. So we come back to this question though, if the lion's roar is incorrect, what might dinosaurs have sounded like? We don't know if they have a larynx-based sound source or a syrinx-based sound source. We're working on it, but we don't know that yet. But what can we say? So if we have this dinosaur, this is, a, this is one imaginary imagination of a, a T-Rex. And what we know about living crocodilians and birds is that actually large-bodied birds that are more basal with, that are earlier evolutionary branches within birds. <sighs> now it's playing when I didn't want it to. But we'll try that again in a moment. These guys um, produce sound with a mouth closed. So these guys have a syrinx. Large-bodied birds differentially produce their important um, communication sounds with the mouth closed. The same is true in crocodilians. They're closed mouth vocalizers. So just try it. It's hard, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a little difficult. Not for them. Whereas when we get into more derived birds and small bodied birds, they're open mouth vocalizers. So what's one big difference from a lion's roar? Try to make a lion roar with its mouth closed. It's a different thing. You're, that's upper vocal tract filtering. You're changing what the shape of the mouth is. It's going to change the sound that comes out. So these guys, regardless of whether they have a syrinx or a larynx, and if you want, you can, whoever's up there can help me play these. But what we'll see over here, <laughs> that can sound a little like a roar, but that sound is made with the mouth closed. If we look at this sound over here, the f that would be lovely if you could play it. This is another common crocodilian signaling call that is also made with the mouth closed. This sound here that we heard already is associated with a visual display, bubbling water. And it's a, it's a communication call rather than a distress call or a um, contact call. So other types of calls that aren't for attracting a mate or signaling territory can be made with the mouth open. For example, almost any animal, if you pick it up and squeeze, it will go, ah. <laughs> and ah is universally an open mouth sound. Regardless of what they use to make their principal uh, sexual uh, 
call the functions in communication with congeners or other parts of their species. So let's play this one. This one we have to be really quiet for because it's the sound of a uh, ostrich and it's very low frequency. It's not yet started. I think so that deep, deep, uh, sl low frequency sound that you heard that's made here. So in these closed mouth vocal behaviors, uh, typically the esophagus is actually inflated. The esophagus in birds is non-muscular, so it can be inflated into huge sizes. And that's used as this part of this upper vocal tract filter in living birds. Um, lots of living birds, for example, doves. We see doves all the time. Just think of them inflating their esophagus now all the time. So we don't know whether dinosaurs had a closed mouth type call like what we see or most dinosaurs uh, like we see in crocodilians that vocalize with the larynx or if they had a syrinx based sound source but also use closed mouth vocal behavior as in many but not all large body birds. Or if we play the last sound, this is a very derived sound associated with small bodied birds. Let's play this last sound here. So the other thing that we know about dinosaurs is that generally speaking, they're much, they're big. They're way bigger than any living bird. These small bodied guys actually um, have a high frequency note. So we know that the frequency, the average frequency is associated, but not totally correlated with body size. So think of the size of a large dinosaur. That's going to be a very low frequency call, most likely. So more like what we heard with the ostrich type sound. So um, that's what we know from looking at living animals and looking at evolutionary data for the relationships of dinosaurs. But what might we find from the fossil record? So I had actually started this research on trying to look at dinosaur sound making before I found out that a fossil on my desk had a, the earliest known fossilized sy syrinx preserved. This fossil had been on my desk for about five years. <laughs> and I was just trying to fi finish up some work on it to send it back to Argentina where it was, f where it was housed. And um, I had been thinking about the evolution of vocal vocalization, had a proto collaboration on that. And what we found was a three dimensionally preserved syrinx in a fossil that's about 66 million years old. So what this showed was that actually we can have beautifully three-dimensional um, fossilized syrinxes, but actually, if we have them, so this is a duck on the left, and this is a crocodilian on the right, we can say something about the growth structure, but since no one had really looked at the geometry in three dimensions of avian syrinxes, almost all the illustrations were 2D, and they were just muscle attachments, we needed to generate a whole new data set of looking at living bird vocal organs to try to make sense of the fossil. So that's what we did. But I have another slide at that at the end if we have time. But the big takeaway is that we, if we look, there had been very little uh, work on the, pro the preservation potential of the avian syrinx. These are the cartilaginous parts, I should say, that the muscles and the vocal folds attach to. So they're like the structure around the business part, right? But now we found evidence that these things could be preserved um, much earlier, earlier than previously thought. So this was from, I like to say that this syrinx that was preserved in, in a fossil that's 66 million years and relative of living ducks is kind of like a Chevy Impala of syrinxes. It's, it's a workhorse, it's good, it's not the Mercedes Benz, it's not the Model T. So this syrinx is not telling us about the first syrinx, which is the Model T. It's telling us sort of, but it's, it's, it's been around it's for a while. Syrinxes have been around for a while by the time we get to this syrinx. So what we don't know still is this question of whether dinosaurs had a syrinx or a larynx based sound source. So that's a big question. And just to conclude with other big questions, vocal production, as we kind of know, isn't just about what makes the sound, my larynx, but it's also about neuronal control, the brain, and the brain pathways that control both the muscles and the, the relationship, the synchronization with respiration. 
and birds have a unique respiratory system that needs that is used in this vocal behavior how much is that tied together in the evolution of dinosaurs so these are all things that we're now trying to tackle um and it's I, it's so much fun what do we know we know that many dinosaurs had extremely small brains that's uh the brain you can see in the in the skull up there how much of it's pretty tidy. And this is much more like an outgroup crocodilian brain in many respects. The forebrain or the front part of the brain is very small. As you get into more raptor dinosaurs, like shown on the top there, you have more forebrain, but it's still quite small compared to what you have in a living bird. So in terms of control of the syrinx, actually a lot of that is in the hindbrain. So it's in, an, it's in a part of the brain that would be present. It's just co-opting muscles and a ner uh, nervous system control from another function. Um, so that you don't need a forebrain for that. But of course, in taxa like this little dude, that are uh, actually take it a step further and have vocal learning, and they have very large brains, and they have very complex syrinxes, uh, that's next level. So we're not going to see anything like, just don't imagine Oviraptor as a big parrot. It's not going to say Polly want a cracker. So last little part, in what context, if we think about these secret lives, in what context would dinosaurs have made sounds? Well, we actually can speak to that by again bringing in evolutionary principles. So, you know, in Jurassic Park, we have these guys. Here's a Chris Pratt with a bunch of velociraptors attacking, and they're making a bunch of noise. Now, I like to point out that do you make a lot of large vocalizations right before you eat a hamburger? <laughs> so all, all vocal, vocalization is done on the exhale. So it'd be as if I go, I may, you know, I give a long sentence here and then just shove a cheeseburger into my mouth. <laughs> so in fact, vocalizing right before you consume your prey item is relatively rare. You might vocalize to scare off other things that are about to try to compete with you for the prey item, but here they're illustrating them working as a pack. So this is not a context in which vocalization is, is common. In fact, within both crocodilians and birds, contexts that are shared is the young pipping and communicating with the adult, adult territorial calls, and adult uh, sexual display calls. So those are contexts in both crocodilians and birds. Um, here's our, my model for sexual display calls. We know that, that, that these are important in both of these taxa. So these are contexts in which we know the most complex vocalizations would have been produced, uh, at least among adults, not necessarily between babies. So sexual selection on um, that affects and promotes the development of more complex visual and vocal displays is a key part of dinosaur evolution, about their secret lives. So I like to say that if you made a more realistic movie with dinosaur sounds in it, it would be a very different movie. And it would also sound pretty different. When we actually scaled up crocodilian type vocalizations for a recent BBC film to an animal, just back of the envelope calculations, an animal the size of T-Rex, that was very, very close to the, ultra, uh, the infrasonic. So what it meant was that it was almost out of our hearing range. And it was scary. So you don't need to just have roars be scary. This was a scary, very, very low frequency sound. So we don't know that that's what T-Rex sounded like, but what we want to think about is, again, how do we bring science to the story? It's, I think it's just as exciting and cool as, uh, as how dinosaurs have been in our imagination. And certainly, I hope that we've seen a transformation now from the dinosaurs in our imagination of the past, when we imagined them as related to lizards and these lumbering things. You know, lizards are... are one of the least vocal groups of vertebrates, to a very different picture of dinosaurs that's informed by our underst of new scientific data. So, um, you know, I like to end with this last question, which to me sort of ties it all together. We often are asked um, or think, 
what would happen if dinosaurs didn't go extinct? Maybe it's something that your five-year-old thinks about. I could have a pet velociraptor. How awesome is that? Well, there was an idea that if dinosaurs didn't go extinct, they would actually evolve to be human-like. And I'd like to close with this. This is an actual idea that was from, I believe, the, the mid-80s, around 86. And the idea was that, that raptor dinosaurs, we knew just from the bony evidence, have more forward-facing, slightly more forward-facing eyes. They have bigger brains. They're bipedal like we are. They have these long forelimbs. So we said, oh, if it keeps evolving, this troodonid, it might look like this very frightening-looking thing over here on the, on the right. But... This gets at our notion of advanced cognition, complex behaviors, and complex vocal communication. We imagine them in things like us. But if I want to close with one thing, it's that locating dinosaurs correctly in the tree of life kind of destabilizes our notion of what these, the uniqueness of our large brain, of our complex communication. Because, in fact, dinosaurs did not go extinct. And they're just as impressive today. We have crows that can create tools that are more complex than other, any other ape besides us. So I want us to think about what uh, kind of our view of what intelligence looks like, our view of what um, complex behaviors look like. Because it's easy for us to focus on our own human uniqueness and not see all of the wonderful guys around with us. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Fascinating talk. So we will alternate the mics from either side. There's one over there. You can just sort of yell it out if the mic's not going to get to you. And, or there's two. Okay, yeah. Uh, you made a discovery in an old fossil that was already sitting on your desk. Yes. Are people making a lot of discoveries going back into the dusty file drawers? and looking Look, at I want everyone drawers? to take out their dinosaurs and look for, for syrinxes and tracheas. I mean, I'm doing it. Because everyone thought they, they wouldn't preserve. And I, I've been looking for a while. I have one more candidate that's, that's uh, another, um, it's a little more basal than what I have now. But yeah, you can. Because what it does is like when you ask a new question, you look at the data in a new way, and it forces you to, 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 to look for things you've, you haven't thought about. Which I think is super awesome and fun, you know, um, to realize we didn't know as much as we thought we did. So, yeah. Uh, you, you, that was a wonderful talk. I mean, that, that was just fabulous. And uh, Thank you. A, a lot of what was so terrific about it is you start with the fossils and then you look at the uh, way modern animals work and you try to retrofit that back. You, you made some offhand remarks about molecular analysis. Mm -hmm. Are you doing sure. that with the DNA also, trying to uh, we, look at modern animals' DNA and project that backwards towards the dinosaurs? Yeah, so one of the coolest things we did on that was a collaboration that was led by my collaborator, who's a molecular uh, biologist. Um, but what we did was estimate, we looked at all of the genes involved in feather development in living birds, and we uh, did a whole genome analysis of about... 12 to 15 different vertebrates and, and estimated when that full complement of every gene known to be involved in feather development arose. And what we found was that all of those genes were present in the ancestor of mammals and birds. I thought it was amazingly cool because actually a lot of those genes were shared in the production of hair. And what it means is that animal body covering perhaps underwent its most fundamental change when animals moved onto land not when they started reproducing away from the water. So anyway, short answer is yes, um, but I do that work in collaboration because I'm a morphologist um, by training and by interest, and so we work together to sort of look at these questions um, to deploy molecular tools with thinking about morphology. So yeah. Again, a very, very good talk. Uh, but one thing that I thought you 
skipped over yes. completely is feathers as insulation. Sure. And I was curious. Well, that's because I don't know the answer. Because, you know, the truth being, um, I can't figure out why an animal that didn't have an endothermic physiology would use feathers for ins installation. So then if you assume that, that the first filaments or fuzz arose for the purpose of insulation, then you have to assume higher metabolic rates. Not necessarily crown like avian or mammalian metabolic rates, but they're related. So when I see people talk about insulation, I ask, well, let's put all the data together in terms of metabolism, in terms of respiration, in terms of activity level, because you need to put it all together. And there's people who are doing that and starting to think about it. But I don't know the answer. Um, the Mesozoic isn't a particularly cold time. It's a lot warmer than it is present day. I don't know why insulation would be a limiting factor. So that's why, that's kind of what I, what I, I don't know the answer to that one. But that's what I think about relationship with metabolic rate. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there's people waiting. Um, so I'm going to go. Can you help direct me to whoever I should be talking to next? OK, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, by the way, I'm very relieved. When I first heard the title, the Secret Lives of Dinosaurs. I thought we were going to see a lot of dinosaur porn, but I'm very. Yeah. I stay away from that. Uh, yeah, Good. mixed company. But but what I'd like to know is what precedes the dinosaurs, and you might not want yeah. to answer. What precedes the dinosaurs? Where does it evolve into that? And in addition to that, after the meteor hits, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of them that live underground. I guess. I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> then the other thing is, when did they start to fly? When, where does oh, yeah, fly? around about 100, by 150 million, they're airborne, fully airborne. They may before, not move exactly like a living bird, but they're airborne. Before the meteor? Way before, way before, like 80 million years before. Okay, so what yeah. preceded the, the, how did that evolve into dinosaurs? That is a big question. I could talk to you for like two hours. Um, in terms of what we have, we know that, that there's a whole bunch of diverse relatives of birds and crocodiles. So these are really crazy things, like bipedal relatives of crocodiles are running around. There's a pterosaurs that are present. Um, you have a diversity within lizards and snakes. I mean, out, so, so this is a rich ecosystem. Mammals are doing their thing. They're kind of boring in my estimation, but you know, whatever. Um, so I can't give you the full picture. I'm not sure I can, can hone in on the precise area, but it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, over here. Yeah. So, um, I was fascinated uh, when you brought up um, you know, using modern, the, uh, the uh, modern uh, pigmentation of birds as a sort of guide for mm -hmm. trying to figure out what dinosaurs may have looked like. Yep. It reminded me of how um, it, in the embryo, as, an, as embryos, a lot of different animals reflect traits of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. in fact, um, sometimes it persists a little bit after the embryo stage. Uh, there's this one bird called, if I remember correctly, a Watson. Yeah, Watson. Amazon, uh, yeah. That actually has very primitive, almost dinosaur-like uh, limb, uh, or really derived, <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah, it, it's got these modified claws for clambering up t uh, a tree trunks that no other bird really has. So, exactly. yeah. So I'm curious, um, in your research, how has um, you know, embryology okay. um, or so, uh, uh, guided, maybe helped guide your research a little bit, and what are some potential limitations cool. for using that? Yeah. Um, so the whole, like, you know, I mean, the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny or that embryos would give us a key. I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating story, maybe even related to the origin of the Carnegie Institution, because back in the 30s, we thought that if you understood embryos, you understood the evolution of life. And that's, in, you know, on some level reductive because the evolution of life involves so many other things and embryology together. In terms of how we're looking at it, we are collaborating on looking at the, or the developmental origin of the syrinx. And that attempt is to understand what molecular shifts have, have occurred to create this novel vocal organ and to lose functionality in the larynx, which is actually is a really cool question. I can't spill the beans, but we found some really interesting stuff. So um, I don't know. Uh, these, in, these 
these, uh, these, uh, tasks or these really cool questions require perspectives from all sorts of different disciplines to me working together. So I may not have totally answered that question, but maybe it's somewhat interesting. Yeah. You mentioned in your talk several times molecular sequencing. Yes. Um, are you able to do molecular sequencing on, on minerals or does that imply that there are some fossils that are not minerals? No, I was, I was basically saying that when I, when I make the case that tuataras are this, are related to lizards and snakes, it's, it, we use all those bony pieces of evidence that we have, but we can also look to molecular sequence evidence that aligns with that. That's what I meant in the talk. Um, in terms of DNA from dinosaurs, so here's, here's a fun note. Um, Jurassic Park lied to you. I guess that's the subtitle of today's talk. Here are some ways. Amber does not preserve all of the animal. Um, we've had a lot of new birds in amber, and they don't preserve, for example, the trachea. They don't preserve like big chunks of the animal. So just interesting side note on amber. In terms of biomolecules and their stability, melanin is a very stable bi biomolecule. So even stuff that can preserve like, you know, we have tons of mammoths and mastodons with, the, with hair color. We have a lot of... Uh, it's a very stable biomolecule, whereas it's very, it's actually computationally intensive to reconstruct a mammoth genome. DNA is not a very stable biomolecule and it does degrade very rapidly. So I don't really, you know, I'm not, I'm not predicting that we're going to be sequencing dinosaurs tomorrow. Um, that's what I would say on that one. So the sequence you mentioned is sequence of, of extant animals and then inferential techniques, kind of like what I was doing with behavior to look at what the genetic complement and the regulatory complement are in the ancestor of crocs and birds. That's what we're doing there. Sorry if that's a little disappointment. Okay. Hi. Um, so you've kind of reinvented dinosaurs for us by putting all this together. <laughs> I tried. Um, if, if Jurassic Park lied to us about the dinosaurs, okay. so my question is, in reimagining what the dinosaurs look like, do we need to reimagine their entire environment? And have you begun to, and your colleagues begun to think about what the environment right. that the dinosaurs inhabited might have looked like that would be different on the scale of how we need to reimagine dinosaurs? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other data that goes into reconstructing an ecosystem, including data on mammals and on plants and, and all of those things that other groups of people are working on. Uh, I think what maybe you're getting at is, is ecology. So how are dinosaurs interacting with their world? And one thing that I think about a lot is that we emphasize this, you know, ground up, trees down, origin of flight. If you think about it... Um, all of the predators are on the ground, right? So there's, a, you know, if you start thinking about these Cretaceous ecosystems, you can think of selective pressures that may or may not have influenced the acquisition of a trait. So it's, I think it's important to think about whole environments and to know more about, say, living dinosaurs and their whole environments. But the short answer might be there are, are similar in, innovations that are going on in other fields. But it just, you know, separate from dinosaur research that are looking at these ecosystems as well. So I hope that's sort of, you ask, you're asking tricky questions here today. I'm getting stumped. So okay. Then, this there is going to be... To be there's, there's one there, there yeah, that, 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 that hand has been up a up lot. Many times. Okay, can you go ahead? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, you know, like, so, uh, yes, that's a bad answer. All right. Um, the first part of the question was what? Di sexual dimorphism. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, we don't, you know, know because sometimes birds, things that look different, right, could be ontogenetic stages. They could be young versus an adult. That's testable. You can get some signal now for males versus females. We do know in one species of early bird that the males have long tail feathers and the females don't. But we haven't found a case where we can say this individual is a female, it had this color pattern, and this one isn't for, for the color mapping that we've done. We've had single exemplars, and it's actually quite time-consuming to do just even one individual. But uh, second part of the question was, is it keratin? So all... 
Um, reptiles, so including crocs and birds, they all have beta keratin. All of their integumentary things, scales, feathers, are made out of beta keratin. So it's a safe assumption that the integumentary features we see are beta keratin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty yes. much the same question I was about to ask you about uh, any gender differences where you yeah. can find out among the fossils. <laughs> well, there's a, there, I mean, sexual selection and sexual dimorphism is so, um, such a big part of living birds, living dinosaurs, I would have to assume, and there are some studies that have, have argued for sexual dimorphism in, in other dinosaurs, even in bony features that they have. Um, but our team itself has not worked on a male and a female of the same species, which would be really cool to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question about the, um, when did the first filamentous body covering show up? Was it with dinosaurs before? Do we just not have fossil evidence? Do we know, et cetera? Yeah. I think, so my, now you're getting my perspective, and there's some people who strongly disagree with me. Um, but I think based on our study of the genic and these proxies for regulatory innovation in, fe in feathers, controlling feather genes and the development of feathers, um, we estimated an 86 percent identity in the ancestor of crocodiles and birds. That means that you have estimated to have very close to the extent to, what, to what's used in living birds to make feathers in the ancestor of crocs and birds. Um, separate from that evidence, we have pterosaurs that have filaments, and we have a lot of different dinosaurs with bristles and filaments. So I think the genic toolkit, the ability to produce bristles and, and bristle structures or filaments of different sizes and shapes on parts of the body is ancestral to dinosauria. That's what I believe based on the evidence. That said, people make a counter argument and it's quite possibly true. They have this developmental toolkit, um, but there are five or six different origins of this trait. I find that not very uh, parsimonious <laughs> to uh, have five or six different origins of bristles or filaments. So, um, or maybe three to four different origins of bristles or filaments. Um, so I do, I think it's part of that ancestral dinosaurian toolkit and possibly outside of dinosauria, the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs that help. Yeah. Has there been any evidence for filaments before the beginning of the Mesozo Mesozoic era? Yeah, you know, so we just did a huge study on this, like looking at the frequency of preservation of soft tissue structures and the Permian before the Mesozoic record is terrible. I mean, you do have some skin and some non-amniotes, so like some kind of uh, salamandery-like things. Um, but no. So the short answer is no, there are no filaments or bristles from the Permian. Um, even in the Triassic, there are very few records of soft tissue, period. So if we really want to get at that question, we need more fossil sites with soft tissue preservation from the Triassic. There are a couple, but not very many. So go, you become a paleontologist and go find those sites for me. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. There's okay, yeah. Uh, copper is used as a pigment for some feathers. I think in, in uh, some bird, extant birds, uh -huh. and dinosaurs. So copper is uh, incorp incorporated into a copper complex. Mm -hmm. So are you looking at heavy metals using x-ray emission or something? Sure. Essence? So other people are other people are doing that. They're looking at um, the distribution of metals and they're using say like synchrotron technology to map different elemental compositions across skeletons. Another colleague of mine who has not published this result actually found that copper was really common and not like I think there's some diagenetic effects that may increase the presence of copper that are potentially unrelated to feather color, but that's not published to my knowledge. I'm not doing it. I've actually kind of moved on to this whole vocalization thing. <laughs> I'm still doing co some color work, but I'm, I'm really fascinated with trying to crack the nut of what did dinosaurs sound like? How can we reconstruct sound in extinct dinosaurs? So that's my primary focus um, f right now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah. out. <laughs>